All right, let's try this again. All right, sorry everybody. Cool, cool, cool. Sorry. Um, Jay was telling us a story. We didn't hear. We're getting. We'll get him back here, you guys. So sorry. Maybe you can hear me now. Give me a thumbs up. Nice. I see a thumbs up. There's a wave. That's cool. Ethan, thank you. Um, all right, cool. So we'll get we'll get Jay back here. He was telling us some awesome story that we couldn't hear. Um, can't. Can you guys hear me? Um, I'm getting some thumbs up that maybe you can hear me just to, um, and maybe Jay can come back in. A little technical difficulty, guys. Okay, good. You can hear me. Okay, fantastic. All right, great. So we'll get Jay to, um come back in um, Jay if you don't mind just uh, clicking back in a little bit we were talking to Jay about uh, just his uh, his experiences uh, in his early years about how it got him into the business um, and uh, as soon as we get him back um, this oh here we go here we go. We're going to get Jay back. All right. Um, we should have him any minute now. Thank you for your patience, you guys. All right. Oh, you, nice. Back. All right, cool, dude. Cool. Sorry. I don't know. It's, it's not a perfect science. This live thing. Yeah. Well, you know. We could send people to the moon. But it's know. quasar science, but not, it's not a perfect science. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're trying. Right. We're trying. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, don't know where, I don't know where I lost you guys. So. I don't know. I think it was pretty early on. Your early days, you were talking, your dad was a machinist, the last thing I heard. So you were talking for a little while. That's right. So I took, I took machine trades as a trade, and I was, ended up uh, being hired by the school to uh, help teach night class. I was doing pretty pretty good in mm -hmm. it. It just came to me. My, my dad helped me a lot with it. And uh, after right after I graduated, I ended up working at a, at a machine shop that was a friend of my dad's. Yeah. And there was probably 35 of us that worked in this small machine shop. And after, well, a year, about a year had gone by, my best friend, David Strong, and my cousin Jerry Hall had moved down to Wilmington. They got the call to work on some movies at Dino De Laurentiis' new uh, complex there. I wanted to go, but I was working at this machine shop. Well, they so happened they laid off a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. They kept kept me on, and I just kept hoping that the day would come where I would get laid off because right. I wanted to go and join those guys. So about a year had gone by, and I got the word one morning that I was being laid off. So. I moved down to Wilmington right then and there and joined David and Jerry and, you know, a bunch of other people. I didn't start out as an electrician. I started out as a driver. My first movie was on Maximum Overdrive with Emilio Estevez. It was a Stephen King movie. And I ended up, you know, picking up, uh, I ended up picking the actors up and driving them back and forth the set and, you know, yeah. what drivers do on set. Meanwhile, I'm watching all my buddies over there working set as electricians. I kept thinking, man, that's so much cooler than being a driver. Yeah. And so got my foot in the door. Uh, Jock Brandis was the gaffer. He was like the go-to gaffer in Wilmington at the time. Right on. And uh, I started working with Jock a lot and helping him work on generators for both the studio and himself because he had an 1800 amp generator. Uh -huh. And uh, D David and I both ended up, you know, working as the Jenny operator for quite a while. I, I, David ended up working on set, and then I took over as Jenny operator. Sure. 
and uh, one thing one thing led to another. You're right on. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so, so did you, Jay? Did you have like you, you were doing that, and and so your your passion for lighting came from just being being there, immersed in the in the filmmaking experience. You you would say. That's right. That's right. And you know when I started work as an electrician as a lighting technician on those sets it was non-union yeah we would work six days, six days a week 16 hours a sure. day and think not think nothing of it sure you know? sure um but but yeah i would uh you know the first i think the first movie i did i worked for free just to learn what was going on you know you, you can't get away with that these days yeah but back then you did that's how you got your foot yeah. in the door. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you were you were in the early days, if I'm understanding correctly. You were primary. You were a Jenny op on a job. I was a Jenny op. Yeah, I ended up being a generator operator on quite a few yeah, jobs. Yeah, yeah, and that was within that studio system. And 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 Jacques was the gaffer on those shows. Jack Jacques was the gaffer, and like I said, he owned some generators also. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, David and I both helped helped him build an eighteen hundred amp generator, which was big at the yeah. time. The studio had some generators that they hired Jock to yeah. build for them. So that's cool. So I was kind of hired on to soundproof them, you know, do whatever needed to be done to these generators. I ended up running those generators as well. It was either for Dino himself on movies, other productions that came in, or for Jock Brandis, depending yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it was. Listen, someone just so, yeah. someone just posted this thing that says, "I wish I could be behind somebody and work for free just to see how it works and what's going on." And in a way, that's what we were doing. In a way, like like we all learned on the job. You have like this passion for filmmaking, you passion for what what you're doing, and then and that's right. and. And that just kind of drives you to do the next thing, which is really, really cool. I know I know. last week we had a few questions uh, posted towards me just about like, how do you become a gaffer? You know, and, and, and you, you started through the ranks and worked your, worked your way through the ranks up to being the department head, the chief lighting technician. Um, that's right. And, and that's really the way to go. I think that because then you really just see the inner workings of how, how it works. Again, you started non-union. You eventually got in the, in the union, which helps your have some health care and things like that, and 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 that's really great. That's right. And you guys, you guys worked on the the movie Manhunter, right? I did. I was the Gen, Jenny operator on Manhunter as well. But of course, back then when you were the Jenny operator, you would jump in and help. You know, you would run cable, you would wrap cable, you would that's set right. lights, you would. That's that's how we did it back then. You, you know, and you were. I had that. And you were good friends with. You had, were like buddies with the gaffer. Like you were like always watching what he was doing. Like I I know personally. Like you know I felt lucky to be a gaffer because I got to work with all these cool DPs and steal all their ideas. You know. That's right. Um, well, the the gaffer on Manhunter was John Ferguson, okay. and uh, he and he and Jock both came down from Canada when the studio started being built. Mm -hmm. Um, Jock on, on Manhunter, which was a Michael Mann movie. It was the first part, really, of Science of the Lambs. It was originally called Red Dragon, which they changed the name to Manhunter. Right. Um, anyway, they, uh, that, that was, uh, you know, just many, many long hours on that film. As a Jenny operator on that, I was averaging 18, 19 hours oh, a day. Oh, my Lord. I was always there. I was always there first. I was always the last one to leave, and I would, I would get to the apartment where a couple of us were renting a big mansion in Wilmington. Yeah. I would get home and everybody'd be in bed. Yeah, and I'd get up and go to work, and everyone was still in bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. That's great. That's crazy. Well, you're younger, and you can kind of do that when you're a little younger. <laughs> Not to show my age, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but there's some crazy right. story about shooting live rounds on that show, wasn't there? Like Michael Mann style? Like, what's that all about? Let's hear about that. Yeah, there was a, yeah, we had, we had three days left of shooting and we were shooting in the swamps uh, across downtown Wilmington, across the Cape Fear River was this swamp area. 
of cypress trees and whatnot. Well, they, they built the dollar hide set in that swamp area yeah. in the tree. Cool. And so they had to, you know, they had to cut in a gravel road all the way back in there and get to the set. And we were, uh, we were pulling some really long hours on at that time because we were shooting nights. And this particular night, they had a huge amount of lighting going on for this shootout scene in the Dollar Hyde house between Dollar Hyde and the FBI agents. And so it was about 3.30 in the morning, and I noticed the temperature started rising on the generator, and it was an 1800 amp generator that was owned by Jock Brandis. So the way to allow more air in to cool it down is you'd have to climb up on top of the roof and you open these flaps. So I get up there, I open these flaps up to allow more air yeah. in. And all of a sudden, I hear this gunshot. Well, on a set like that, you don't think much of gunshots. You know, you hear them all the time. This one was a little different, though. You could actually hear the round whizzing through the tree branches above my head. And I had to stop for a second. I thought, that, that sounds like a live round. Right. That's so crazy. I, I sat there. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, he froze again. And okay. then it made a... A 90 degree into the set like a driveway. Yeah. And, and so I could hear this ringing through the trees, branches hit, you know, ricocheting around above me. So I, I had to stop and I thought, what the heck is going on? I hear another gunshot and I hear the same thing. Well, I realized that these are live rounds. So I get down on the top of the roof and I kind of scurry to the back of the <laughs> generator and I start to climb down off the back and I hear another shot go off and I can hear it hit something. Well, what it hit was the special effects trailer. What the? That was out there on That's the road. That's insane. And our transpo captain was sitting inside there. He was sitting inside the their truck reading. Something. Yeah, right. Well, this, this round went through one wall of the 40, 48 footer right in front of him and hit the other one. Oh my God. And lodged in, lodged in the other side of the trailer. So he comes running out of the back of his, out of the, the special effects trailer. Generator was right behind the special effects trailer. He comes running up as I'm climbing off the back of the generator. And he's like, Jay, what's going on? I said, I don't know. Someone's firing live rounds. Just then we hear three more shots. And in a perfect little triangle, like the Quasar emblem, <laughs> dink, 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 three bullet holes right in the side of the generator. Crazy. No more than No more than a foot away from both of our heads. Wow. So we both get down and he gets on the radio. Who's firing live rounds? What's going on? Well, they yell, they yell cut. Cause now there's just all this radio stuff going on. Well, come, come to find out the special effects people, they owned the guns, but there was a gun handler on the set who would take the guns from special effects and do what needed to be sure. done. Evidently, our director wanted to catch the, the live action slow-mo of a bullet round going through the glass. And so they were firing these live rounds and they didn't clear the area back in the back. Oh, special wow. effects didn't know anything about it. So there was a big argument that took place on set I'm standing back by the generator, still not really knowing what was going on because it was all happening on the set, and I'm at the generator. Well, effects pulled all their weapons, and they packed up and they quit the show. They left. Yeah. So if you watch if you watch that sh movie right towards the end, and you look closely, you can actually see the last couple scenes where they're going like this, firing, and there's the you know, sound effects of firing, but they're not holding any weapons because special effects pulled sure. them. So it wasn't, it wasn't until the next morning, um, you know, they called a wrap because of everything that was going on. That's insane. Everybody left. I still didn't have any answers. Didn't know why it happened. Didn't, wasn't sure what was going That's on. Insane. So the next morning, I, I get to set. I start up the generator. Well, Chuck Brandis, who owned the generator, he pulls up. He says, listen, I got a call early this morning. I heard what happened on set last night he said if they even look at you cross-eyed tonight i want you to just 
pull the plug and just leave, get out right. of there. He goes, they, they owe me, they owe me some back rent. They haven't, you know, they've been slow on payments, this and that and there. So sure. I'm thinking, man, <laughs> all right. Well, I, yeah. I'm feeling a little, I'm feeling a little power. Yeah. Here. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> so I'm standing out by the generator and here comes the crew. Here comes the director and here comes the ADs and they're all walking by me. They have to pass the generator to get to set. And I'm kind of looking at them. None of them will look at me. None of them will say a word to me. They just walk right by me and onto the set. So we, you know, we're rolling for six, eight, six or seven hours. Actually, I think we got a lot of meal pills. They broke for lunch and we all went to eat and I still didn't know why this had happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So right after lunch, they got the first big lighting set up. And then I thought, you know what? I, I don't understand why this happened. I have no answer. So I got on the radio to John Ferguson, who was the gaffer. Mm -hmm. And I said, John, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm pulling the plug. Yeah. Well, I can hear all kinds of commotion going on in there. And I can hear John and the director is kind of, what, what's he talking about? What's going on? So the radio goes dead and I'm sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> he comes back on the radio. He goes, Jay, what do you want to stay? Keep the generator up and running. <laughs> nice. I hadn't even thought about what I They're wanted. Right. So, so I thought, wow, man, what can I get? Okay, well, I, I want Jock's rental payments here before we wrap in the morning. He hasn't been paid in three weeks. He's got to have that. I also want double time for the whole crew for the past week <laughs> nice. of shooting because it's such long hours. And I can hear kind of screams going on. The radio That's goes dead. Funny. And now I can hear crew members in the background through the trees cheering. Yeah, you go, Jay. <laughs> That's funny. He gets back on the radio. John Ferguson, the guy, he gets back on. He goes, okay, you got That's it. That's awesome. Well, they had, they had jocks check there and uh, before rap, and they paid everybody double time. That's awesome. But we only had, two, we only had those two nights left of shooting. And the, that third night, as soon as they called rap, I shut it down and pulled out. Yeah, <laughs> I was so done with, with it. Right, that's funny. <laughs> but there were there there were a lot of lawsuits over that, and a lot of things that a lot of laws that we have now are directly responsible because of that particular night of shooting right. on Manhattan. Right on, right on. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> so the the um, you know um, you and you and Jacques worked together a lot. You know, I, re I remember hearing some story via Stephen Shaw, I think, that about how you guys, how you guys used to make lightning with carbon rods. Did you use like Trico clips and carbon rods and put like a, what did you guys do to do that? Like this was before lightning strikes, I, I think. This was before lightning strikes. Like it was, it was. Jacques, Jacques Brand is, is a, a genius. The, the guy, he was, he was a great, mentor um he was great to learn a lot of things you know on what to do things on what not to do and and and, met, and, 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 and not to interrupt you because i want to keep your thought but the men mentorship in this business is really important really important right like like we we latch you work on these crews and you latch on to somebody and we all have them they, we all have idols and we have men mentors that come through our careers and you latch onto them and really like these are the people that teach you the trade the work experience that happens on the job and you know because it, that's right yeah. you know and, and back and back then in the in the mid 80s and stuff there weren't there weren't like the film trade schools really that there 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 is now so anyways i, I didn't mean to interrupt you but but i i, I want to hear the story about how you guys made lightning <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, um, Jock, of course, knows everything there is to know about everything. It seems. You're right. He would he would make these scissor rods with a little thing in the middle, yeah. right? These were the handles, and on the other end, he would run the cables up to them and mount these carbon rods. Mm -hmm. And he manufactured these frames out of mm -hmm. steel, welded them all together, and then cut pieces of mirror and put inside this as a as a mirrored box and inside were these two carbon that's rods. cool and and he'd make these chokes out of you know whatever. there were the little thin they were Two fat things. carbon rods little thin carbon rods like they were what, what? Well, they, they were the normal carbon rod, rods that you'd use in carbon rods. yeah um 
but you know it was the craziest thing because this cable would be going up to this thing and he had a junior pin on this and set it on a stand and he'd stand underneath it and and he'd yell out to everybody don't anyone watch this you know and juice be flowing to this thing and he'd scissor that thing and those rods would come together and hit and you know <laughs> you'd get that you'd get that you'd get that arc, man, and it would reflect off the mirrors and create lightning. I mean, that, 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 was, that is that what was... lightning is, really. I mean, you guys were actually making lightning. That's awesome. So cool. It was, it was, it was crazy. So it was, now, it was things... Just the... electrically, Jay, like, I'm sorry, I might have missed this part. Like, you have to put a big load on that phase, right? Like, do you, to, to, to get the, like, you got to put a 10K on that, then to, to close... Close the, I mean, because the carbon rod is, is kind of like the circuit breaker. You close it and it arcs and then you open it and it shuts off. But you need the load. Right? right. Well, he would run it. He would always run a separate generator just for that because it was just the power going into it. I got it. Got it. And I can, I can remember at times seeing out there in the, in the parking lot when he was first testing it and there'd be this run of cable. And sometimes you'd get a coil of cable. He'd hit that thing, and that cable would jump up off the ground like this. <laughs> and would he? That's why we figure eight. Would he be? Would he, Jay? Would he be the one to actually do it, or would he like, like call it, Jay? Come over here, and you do this. <laughs> oh no, he he would always be the one who did it in the beginning. He, you know, he had to get to the point where he trusted people weren't playing around or doing anything. And that, and there again, that's that's what you do. You latch onto these guys, and you listen. You know, you, if you're playing around, you're missing something. So my advice from over the years to people has always been, listen up. The more you can listen, the better off you'll be, the better you'll do. Yeah, yeah. Just listen and, and find out why they're doing the things that they're doing and how they're doing them. And, you know, it's it. some people will ask, you know, well, why'd you do it like this? Well, I grew up that in the industry and I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more of why they were doing a specific thing why they were using a soft light instead of a hard light or a hard light instead of a soft light i want to know you know what's what would happen if this thing collided and you know everything went to shit um because I, I i would see some pretty crazy things and learned a lot from that man john and he's he's still around he's uh he's running a whole nother company now right um he's not really in the film business anymore right but the guy really is you know like like you know what it brings up is like we have you, you know you work on a movie you work on a tv show and you, you know like this business is not like many others right you 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 work on a movie for six months or however long it is and and you, that crew becomes a little family right like that's right. Like, and, and those are really nice. Those are nice moments that we remember, you know, like, like you guys, like the first time Jacques broke out that, like his lightning rig, you know, that, that must've been pretty cool for you. And the, like, and, and I'm sure you've taken that experience and those experiences that you've had with him to define what you do now as a chief lighting technician, you know? That's right. That's and, right. and, and I think that's really, uh, I think that's really, I think that's really interesting. So you did, um, just to shift it up a little bit, you had a very long standing career with uh, cinematographer Mark Irwin. Like uh, we spoke of Osmosis Jones, the Farley Brothers movies, and you did, I don't know how many movies did you do with them? Like a lot, a lot of films. Um, over 50 features with Mark Irwin. And you know, we used to work, we used to do three features a year. And, you know, Mark was great because, and he was also a great mentor. And I also learned a ton of stuff from him. He knew all the tricks. Yeah. Um, and I met Mark through Jock Brandis. Yeah. You know, Jock and I ended up coming out to, to uh, LA to do a couple movies with Mark. Oh, cool. Cause Mark and Jock went way back in Canada. Cause Mark's from Canada originally. Oh, cool. cool. Um, so, so yeah, Mark, Mark was, uh, very instrumental in the things that I've learned over the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's really great. And we hope we hope to maybe get Mark on on here. Maybe you and Mark could do a session together. I think that'd be super cool. You know, get you guys good yeah, talk, I... talking about what you guys did as a team together as a cinematographer and a and a lighting and, a, and lighting guys. And you're both really good lighting guys. So it'd be that'd be super cool to 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 get that going. Um, you know, it, it makes me think a little bit. I don't mean to be switching around too much here, Jay, but like I. I wonder, you know, like a lot of guys come up into the business, I want to address a little bit like these, uh, you know, the younger, our, our younger gaffers that are trying to break into the business. They're doing, you know, like you and I, we worked on super no budget movies. I remember working for 50 bucks a day in the, in the late 80s. And, That's you right. know what I mean? And, and non-union. And, you know, just some advice to those guys. Like, what, 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 what would you say to these guys? What, you know, what does the aspiring gaffer need to know? You know, like, what, what, what do you think? You know, like, just informal discussion about. Well, uh, again, listen. Right. Listen to what's going on. You listen. Don't miss the the cues and the key words that are being said. And, uh, you know, there, there was a bit of hustling going on back then. It, I know that nowadays you're not really supposed to run on set, but back then <laughs> we used to run like crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, you ran for the light. You ran, got whatever you needed. And when someone got a light, they called it out. And when someone called out the light, someone else was calling out that they had power. It was a whole game of trying to be super quick about it. Um, but you want to you wanna listen and you want to learn – the equipment. Sure. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of times guys will get lazy and the, some new light will come out and they think that, well, I'll just learn it when it gets on set rather than take the time and figure out how to use that. Sure. Light. So get to know your equipment yeah. and know what your equipment can do for you. What, you know, what light does what, because there's a ton of lights out there. We don't, you know, Quasar Science, we don't, we don't make every light in the business. Every light has a purpose. That's right. My my forty eight foot trailer has lights from all kinds of uh, different companies, sure. Because they all serve a purpose. That's right, they're tools, right, Jay? They're tools. They're tools. They're tools you know, That's you right. know, like a you know a Fresnel, a two K Fresnel can't replace a four foot LED lamp. You know, like like they, right. they do two very specific things or tools, just just like. That's just right. like a, a dolly is a tool, a steady cam is a tool, and and these are the things. Would you say that like you know I know a lot. I I spent a very short you know way early on early on I spent a short little bit of time like working at a rental house, you know, and that's mm -hmm. you know I think you know a lot of guys do that, a lot of women do that 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 are coming up through the ranks. Um, what? Do you think that's a cool? Did you did you do ever spend any time in a rental house, like learning the gear, doing the thing, or was it more just on the job? No, no. Again, I I started out my first job was a driver, and then quickly moved over to the lighting department. That's where I've been ever since. But yeah. uh, you know, when I was a best boy, you uh, it was uh, when I was a best boy, I I couldn't stand to lose any piece of equipment. And when gear was coming into the back of the truck. I made sure every single piece of equipment was there. Every scrim was counted for. And if it wasn't, the guys would go back out and find it. Sure. Um, that's kind of hard to do sometimes nowadays, but because uh, there's so much. But uh, yeah, if you can get a, your foot in the door and start working at a rental house and learn what the lights are and what they do, you may not know exactly how to use those lights. That's right. You may know how to turn them on and off and spot and flood or whatever. You know, that's, that, that, you know, that's really interesting because, you know, when you and I got started in this business, you had, you had Fresnels, you had open faces, you had zip lights, soft lights, you had HMIs, you had, um, you know, HMIs have only been around for maybe 10 years when we got started and they had all kinds of problems and magnetic ballast and all the difficulties with that. That's right. And, and now being a set lighting technician is like, you got, it's a technology job. It's almost like set right. lighting technicians are in there with the camera guys, you know, like the camera, the camera department, the, the ACs have so much, I mean, 
there's from Sony Venices to Alexa's to like every camera has a different profile, different way to work. And our lighting, our light art, whether it's a Quasar light, whether it's a Roscoe light, whether it's a, an airy product, whatever the product is, there's different profiles. There's all kinds of different things to learn. You know what I mean? Do you have any, do right. you have any advice for guys coming up uh, in, in the business about how to manage that, how to like, you know, I mean, you have to do it as a department head, you know, like That's whether right. you, you're using an, an Astera or a Quasar or whatever the heck you're using, you have to like, and you kind of have to manage all your guys on your crew have to know all this too. Do you, you know, like, That's right. what, what do you, what do you, what do you That's think right. about all that? It's, it, 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 it's become a handful in a way, right? Oh, well, you know, I don't, I, I don't know every single light because there's, there's so many new lights that come out all the time. I get my hands on a light that I may want to use, and I dive into it and I learn how to use it. That's learn what its capabilities are, what what it's what you're able to do with that light. You know, that makes all the difference because every light serves a different purpose, and and you want to be able to choose the right light for the particular shot. Uh huh. You know. Uh, we're we're lucky. We belong, you know, we belong to the the best union, IATSE union in the world, seven twenty eight. You know, we we have all these classes that we can go to and and learn from, and you know, anyone who's in the union can learn a lot of classes. You don't even have to have the class without, you know, you can you can go to other classes that they offer all the time and learn these things. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a huge help. I mean, it, it's very it's very technical these days way more than it used to be. Um, yeah. But yeah, whether you're non-union or union, if, you know, if you're doing non-union work, there's no reason why you still can't get a hold of these lights and learn them. Uh, again, I worked for seven, eight years non-union. One movie back to back in Wilmington. I mean, they, the longest I ever had off was three weeks. Yeah. He, and uh, before, I, before I moved to LA. Yeah, you, you know what jumps into my head, Jay, is I, I always loved lighting. Maybe you can relate to this as a guy that loves lighting too, is that, you know, lighting's a little bit like Kung Fu. Like as soon as you think that you master it, it'll kick you in the ass. Like as soon as you yeah, think right. like, I, I've done thousands of lighting setups, thousands and thousands of lighting setups. I throw whatever you can at me. And as soon as your kind of head gets in that cocky place, you're going to like, you're going to get buried. You know what I mean? Kung Fu is kind of That's right. like the, a, a study of a martial arts kind of that way too. Right. Is there right. any, is there anything, you know, revelations in your career, 37 year career, man, and you're still going strong, which is awesome in itself. You know, um, is there, are, are there any like, can you think of any milestones, any revelations about like, like, I mean, here, here's how I can relate it to me. Like when I worked on the wire, I realized lighting African American skin is no different than lighting Caucasian skin. And that was a huge revelation mm -hmm. to me. You know, that was like, whoa, like, and I, I, th this is a little bit of a curveball question, but I, I'm wondering, do you, do, any, if you can just think, take it, you know, like what, what kind of thing, was there anything that happened where, where you're like, oh, this is how you do that. You know, like, this is well, what will you know, make we, this along easy. The, along the years, certain products have come out that made the job much easier to do. Like, you know, in the beginning, when we didn't have HMIs, they were PARs the dichroic bulbs and you know you'd still have to add blue to those to get that daylight look um, and then hmis came along that that made the job easier and then uh, you know cut two years later we have we have our hmis we have leds now and leds have become huge yeah um but with with the uh, control grids that made a huge oh difference that's a good that's now, a great point awesome yeah yeah you didn't you know you weren't just light everywhere you know where the grips just have to work their butts off flagging everything because let, let's face it back you you watch any movie from the 80s and 90s and that lighting wasn't always that great right of course you stumble upon the ones that do look good but you can see the mistakes in them right you know a lot of times it's just light bouncing everywhere and 
You couldn't get rid of it. So now we have control grids to control the light better. Oh my God. How you know, great are they? It helps the grip without stands and flags everywhere. You know, it's yeah. So these are the things. And we're about to hit another milestone here, which none of us know the answer to yet because of COVID. We, you know, all the studios are scrambling right now. Everyone's scrambling to figure out how to be safe on set now. Um, so it's going to change some things. You know, you, I don't, I'm betting that like craft service and catering, you're not going to be able to just reach in and pull some food out now. I think everything's going oh to be God. packaged it's somehow. It's so insane. Yeah, it's just going to go from like, yeah, individual packaging. There's all kinds of like uh, us all in masks and gloves and the actors aren't. Like, how are they going to feel? Like, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so we have, LED, we have LEDs right now. Who knows what the future will bring? But, you know, one thing you can always count on is that people in the film industry they're very creative. Yeah. So people are always looking. Yeah. We're always looking. I'm always looking for a new, easier, better way to do something. Something that makes the job easier or rig rig it easier or whatever. You know, you, we just got to make make it easier. Now, technically speaking, it's getting much tougher because you've got to learn all this other stuff that goes along sure. with it. But I think overall, you know, you have more control. You have better control, better lighting. I mean. TV series like the ones you you've been doing lately, look how much better they look. Oh my god, than it's they so did. crazy! They want everyone. Oh, everyone wants these TV shows to look like seventy-five million dollar movies. <laughs> it's like that's right, that's right, and that's those TV shows that will actually hone you to yeah. you know your your whole lighting ability. Yeah, no, for sure. So yeah, because you, know, you got to move, and, you, and it, move you know fast. for people for people who are wanting to bump up to Gaffer, when I bumped up. As Gaffer and I was best boying a lot of jobs, and I had moved out here to Wilmington. I mean, out here to Los Angeles. I was a best boy when I moved out here, but when I moved out here, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to best boy anymore. I'm, I'm a Gaffer. I'm going to, I'm going to be a Gaffer. And I turned down some of the biggest jobs that were going on in Hollywood at the time as best boy. You got to take these small jobs as a you, Gaffer. You got to do That's it, man. Dude, I'm so do. glad you brought that up. I mean, one, thank you for bringing up the uh, the light, lighting control device, the 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 fabric grids that's that that's that was huge that's huge and huge. and huge. and i i love that you just brought up this this thing about like when we make steps up you know yeah you were working as a yeah. jenny op you were working as a jenny op and you knew you got the passion for lighting and wanted to run the lighting department but you knew that <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't just I'm sure the generator operator, the best boy jobs were coming easy. You know, that's I, right. I think that's really important for our audience to hear about, to hear about what is it, what does that mean to make that decision? I mean, I, well, I you know, I relate that to when I was gaffing and making the transition to, to be a cameraman. It's a, it's a scary step. You know, some DPs, make transitions sure. to be directors. These are scary steps, you know, because you might have families to feed, feed and thing like, things like that. So, you know, you can't, That's right. in a way, Jay, right? You can't, you can't be afraid to make these steps. You got to, you got to do it. If you know in your heart that this is something that you want to do, you got to go do it, right? It's the toughest thing, you know, when you're offered these jobs, but yet you're telling yourself, I'm not taking those jobs anymore because now I'm this as opposed to being on set and something happens where suddenly you're thrown into it. And because there, there's those handful of people who get lucky and they get offered the job as a DP and that's when they sure. decide that. But, um, you know, sometimes you, you just have to make the decision for yourself. And that's, that's the scary one when you make that decision and you decide that that's what you're doing now and you just have to stick with it and not go back, you know, unless you absolutely have to. Yeah. Um, or you may find out that, you know, that maybe you made a mistake and you don't want to do that, <laughs> you know. But, yeah. Did you, um, did you ever have aspirations to be a, a cinematographer? I, I did, of course. Yeah, I wanted to. That was what I was going for all along. And, and I had my opportunities. Uh, I shot a couple, couple films, but things started changing, you know, and with, with monitors, being on set and this and that and the other, you know, I've always been wanting to learn by my surroundings and see what's going on with 
the DP and, and, and or gaffers when I was coming up through the ranks. Sure. Um, you know, it, things changed a lot. Uh, DPs used to get a ton of respect on set. They, they still get the, re they still get respect, but they're not quite treated the same because now everybody can see their work on, a, on a monitor. And sometimes you'll have someone who has been in the business, but maybe a year or maybe two years and they're somehow a producer or something and they're commenting on sure. it. They don't like what, you know, and that's kind of a hard one to choke down. So yeah, no, it, I owned a lot of it. Yeah, no, it's hard. I mean, the, we, you, you know, like when you were working, doing all that work with Mark or when you guys had the mystique of the photochemical process, you know, nobody knew mm -hmm. what it was going to look like except you and Mark and how you, where you were setting right. the key and where you were setting the fill and how that related to the spec, the exposure latitude of the film and the color curve of the film. And only you guys knew that. That's right. We you didn't, know, like that. We didn't always know until we, we didn't always know until we went and watched dailies. And, and I, I will say that the one movie that really killed me on dailies was mighty ducks. <laughs> Cause our director, we would shoot every scene on every duck you know, in its entirety, even if they had no lines, sure. we would shoot this kid with his reactions, looking at the other kids, and, and we would have to sit through two hours of dailies every single. Oh night. my god! To just like and, just uh, to make sure the eye lines are right and stuff, like oh. everything, yeah. you know, makes whatever. It got to the point where you know, Mark, he's a smart guy, so he would we would high speed through, yeah, them, you know, run those <laughs> frames really quickly, and we could tell if there was something wrong or not. But but yeah, you know. Part of me misses dailies, and a part of me does not miss going and watching dailies anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, because you were always tired. I mean, I remember when this digital craze happened, like, I, I which was, it was a little, like, I made my transition from GAF into DP in nine years ago or something, maybe 10 years ago, you know, and we, right. the shows were shooting on the Sony F900, which had its, you know, wasn't awesome. You know, that's a hard transition to go from 35 millimeter film to an F900. No offense, Sony, but that's not an easy transition, you know, you know, much, right. you know, much easier with the geniusness of the Alexa and the Sony Venice and in these, the, the technology has gone so far now, you know, the, um, but I remember like, when we were going through this process, I was like, let's go back to black and white monitors, man. Like, why can't we just, okay. Like, remember the day in the film days, you had these shitty monitors and no, no, oh, yeah. you, you know, now every, now it's expected. Now it's expected that, you know, you have these, you have these 15,000, 20,000 and now with HDR $30,000 monitors in multiples. You know, at the at, at right. the DIT card and stuff like that, and everybody's everybody's a judge. It drives me in, it drives me insane. Not to just tell everyone to yeah. go jump off a cliff. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, that's right. But, that's exactly but right. Remember that? You know, remember what that? You know, like that was just the, that was just such a cool thing because it was about this mystique that we did. You know, that it, it's like yeah. you got paid because you had this thing with a ball a bubble or a flat disc that like was reading the light and nobody else knew what was going on <laughs> you know like right. like th right. those were there was a real mystique about it back then <laughs> yeah 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 now you're lighting from, you're lighting from just the monitor so yeah yeah it's kind of crazy yeah you know? um i um you know what i want to talk about really quick is is your relationship with key grips like what, tell me about that. Like what, you know, I'm sure you get to hire the key grip sometimes. And I'm sure that your D and DP but... gets to hire the grip sometimes. You guys maybe work together yep, with that yep. sometimes. And, and what, and what's that like as, as the head of the lighting department and they're the head of the rigging department, the, the, the grip department, making the shadow, you're, you're bringing the light into the scene. They're taking light away from the scene. What do you look for in a key grip? What do you, you know, like what, what's. Well, first and foremost, someone who's good to work with. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's certain people that you sometimes bump, bump heads with, whether it's your fault or their fault or whatever, but I've been pretty fortunate. I've had some really great key grips 
that I've worked with. Um, Chuck Smallwood, uh, Paul Schmidt, who I've been working with for the last few years mm -hmm. with uh, Mark During Powell. Sure. Um, Richard Mall, who designed the Max Menace. Yeah, and these I've, are these I've are been, these are all legends. All legends. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're great guys, and they're you know they want to work with you, and they want to figure out the problem. That's what you want. You want it's a collaborative thing. It's not just about lighting. It's you know, it's lighting and grip and and camera, and it's you know the better you can get along with people on set, the better off you'll be. That's true. Sure. You, you don't always have the answers. I don't always have the answers, but sometimes I can talk to the key grip that I'm working with. Maybe he has the answer, you know, or it's the DP who has the answer or whatever, but I, as long as you're uh, got a good work attitude and you actually like the guy you're working with. Like, would you, you, would you rather have your key grip, no lighting? Like last week we talked about this concept of being able to see light, right? And I would. Would you yeah. rather have a key grip that can see light or just be a genius rigger? Like a genius guy, a genius guy like, I got to get the thing up there on the fire escape and I don't know how we're going to get it there. You know, that's his job. And, you know, like, would you? Well, that's, again, that's where I've been fortunate because I feel like the key grips I've been working with are those, both of those. They do both. They're both. genius riggers. Yeah. And they see the light. They, they know what. Is going like on. like so, how much to, as a as a chief lighting technician as a gaffer how much does it help you like you set up some source and they already got the topper coming in they already got the cider and they just didn't bring a floppy they brought a twelve by black solid they made it the real you know like <laughs> like how important how important yeah. is is that it's it's very important and the more you can work with the guy yeah. the better you know I I always hated it when you, know, you do a job and then suddenly something happens where you're starting a new job but you have a key grip you've never worked with before because you have to go through this whole process again sure. it's not that i hate it i should say i just would rather work with the guys that i know that already know what's going on and again with a good tv series you know you you get that you you kind of play off each other really quickly so yeah. it's really good yeah that's that's cool can you think of any um can you think, you got any horror stories about like back in the film days particular about like, oh, like they got called in to the dailies trailer. Okay, like, you know what I mean? That like, that pit in the stomach uh, about, any, can you reach into the furrows and think of any, anything that's happened like that? Well, I was doing, I remember doing a, with Mark Irwin, I was doing a Nightmare on Elm Street 7, which was Wes Craven's seventh uh, yeah, he he had control of all the Nightmare on Elm Streets, but he only directed one and he only directed seven. Even though I did, I, I worked on the last one that was made as well. But yeah, number seven was great because I loved working with Wes Craven. He he was an awesome director. But we shot this uh, cemetery scene, and we had this HMI that just could not. You know, we're we're well well under rolling, and I'm using it as a rim, spotted in from a distance to get it out of frame. It's looking green, you know, and suddenly I get Mark saying, does that light look green? And then just then Wes Craven walks up, he goes, Mark, does that light look green? <laughs> <laughs> they was looking at me and I'm like, you know, so, so we went with it because we had to move on. Yeah. And then that night in daily, well, it was certainly green and <laughs> yeah, you couldn't really correct it that well. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one of the things that uh, it sticks in the back of my head all the time. I was always a, fanatic about color temperature and and again today with leds you know you have a bigger color temperature range than you ever had sure you know without any gels so sure yeah. do you do you do you believe let me ask you this jay like there's a lot of guys out there men and women um that kind of let the alexa i mean i think i know the answer to this question but i'm going to answer it anyway i'm going to ask it anyway but like, do you think that where, let me, let me put it like this, like the Alexa is an incredible machine, right? You could go in and shoot what, like what in our situation right now with my little practical shooting off as a forced perspective in the background and, and the, my little bit of window light coming in here. Um, and it's going to look awesome, right? Keep the, sh keep the shadow towards camera and you're going to win every time with that camera. 
That's right. Well, there's that kind of school of thought. Almost you let the Alexa do the lighting for you, right? Or do you believe that, I mean, you're a lighting guy, you love lighting. So what's the balance in the technology with the technology today? Well, I think it, a lot of times you can go into a situation and the lighting looks great, but generally I play off of that. Um, sure. You know, there's, you, you want to accentuate certain things. You can always... You know, well, I can't say you always can make it look better because sometimes you just can't do better than what nature's already doing. But, but generally speaking, you can do little things to help. You know, you may want to get something for a little kick in the eyes that maybe you're not getting with the natural lighting or whatever. But that's it, it kind of plays how I like to light. I like it to look natural. Yeah. Pretty. You know, I tend to want to key to the look a lot because you get that natural kick in the eyes. Sure, and, and, um, and that allows the, the camera side to be on the shadow side, which always, help, which, mm -hmm. which always helps, you know. Yeah, and sometimes you can't do that, and you have to do other things yeah. to make it look better or good or whatever, but uh, that's kind of how I like it. I like natural, good-looking lighting, you know. Yeah. The, um, where, where it's funny because I'm starting to lose my day. I'm on the East Coast, right? So it's a little bit later here than it is for you. And I'm starting to lose my daylight, lose the daylight. But I got my little Q5 here. There you go. So, <laughs> so that's I great. My, my instinct would be to put it back here just as an edge. What do you think? <laughs> sure. Yeah, it works. Um, so, yeah, no, that's cool. That's, um, um, I think the, um, I think it's um, it's a really it's a cool business, you know. It's really you know, it's a hard business and it's a cool business. I think as a as a department head, you you run a lighting department, the rigging crew, the rigging gaffer works with you directly. A lot of times, you are probably faced with with what I would call business decisions within your job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like you are balance you're balancing your relationship with the DP. Your job your job is to take care of the DP. Make sure they're getting what they That's want. Right. But there's another side of it, the business side of it, as the department head working with production. Right? That's right. And and keeping them happy. Now your best boy your best boy helps you with that. Your rigging at gaffer helps you with that. It's what about that teamwork that that well, you know, me that like is about taking care of the show, taking care of the producers, because these are the guys who are going to hire you again. If you do a good job of that, they're going to call you. Right. again. Well, you know, if you if you're working with a DP who most of them out there today that at least that I've been working with are very easy to work with and, you know, listen. So sometimes they'll want to do something on a set for lighting and you have to, you have to weigh it out, whether it's worth doing that because of the cost or maybe something bigger is coming in the following week that you might need that, that money right. for, you know, something a little bigger. I, I pretty much do a pretty good balance of uh, trying to keep production happy and, and sometimes talking the DP out of something or the key grip out of something that maybe is just a little overkill for the shot. Yeah. You know, something that's going to cost too much money to, to do for, for what that's it right. is. And, uh, cause we, you know, you, you save production where you, where you can, and they're apt to give you the things that you really do insist on when you really need it. So there's definitely a balance there that uh, you have to learn or, or if there's something that you really want and you're getting a no, you have to learn how to, you know, get that no turned into a yes. Yeah, man, and that's that. Bringing it differently, showing them, or you know, that's, there's that's a whole. That's, there's, a, there's that's a, like if you worked in corporate America and you're trying to get an idea across to your your boss that like how, that they don't agree with, and how do you how do you manipulate that so that you come out in uh, in 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 a favorable place, not only. Not only to make your job easier, but to get the DP what he wants. Because so often, so often productions don't, I find this all the time. 
production doesn't necessarily, this isn't a bad thing at all on production's side, but, but production doesn't want to bother the DP. They want to go through the gaffer. They want to go through the key grip. And I don't want to say make right. you guys the bad guy, but they don't, they don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Oh, guys, sorry, we can't like, whatever. We can't afford to put the lighting barge with the BB light out in, in Los Angeles Harbor. You know what I mean? That's right. And you know what? And if you get a no, and it's a firm no, then that's an opportunity. Yeah. It's an opportunity to come up with another way of doing it that will still look great. And I've had plenty of those. I'm, I'm so, stoked you. you know, I'm stoked you said that because it's about sometimes the limitations makes you do something better. Like right. don't be a lot of times. Like don't be scared when this shit doesn't work. That's like right. the generator is going to break down, work, right? The condor is not going to go up. So how do you like? Tell me a let, yeah, tell me a story about like that. Like how often? How often has it happened in your career where like? you were counting on that 124, the 80 foot condor in the background to like do the big broad wash. And oh my God, it's like half, it gets half of your work done for the night, you know? And it. Oh, it's funny you say that. Cause I was doing a, a movie with Mark Irwin and we were shooting across from the Beverly Hills Hilton hotel sure. there in, in Beverly. And we were shooting nights and we were shooting in that park that's over there. And I had a 65 foot condor, not, not a really big mm -hmm. one. But we had some lights mounted in with the whole thing. We're getting ready to shoot nights there, you know, and want to take this condor up. Well, as things happen sometimes, the hydraulics, something went out. We couldn't do anything to get that condor to go up. Yeah. I think it was it was about 12 feet off the ground. So that's how we lit it. We lit it with, with the lights being 12 feet off the ground. And it looked great. So, you know, you, you just have to roll with things. And, and that kind of leads me into another story. And I, and I wanted to tell this because... You have to come up with solutions sometimes for things on the spot. When you're the when you're the gaffer, if you don't have a solution, it, it's very costly. I was doing a movie called The Bedroom Window, and I was the Jenny operator on it. And uh, we were shooting in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and we were shooting nights, and it was a Friday night. I think it may have even been. We only had that day or maybe a couple more days left of shooting, but we were shooting nights on a Friday night when all of a sudden the generator goes down. Yeah. Now I was, I was the Jenny operator and it had been running smooth that whole night. Well, it goes down at about 2 AM and I run up to the generator and I climb up inside of it to figure out what's going on. And I can see smoke coming from where the alternator was. Yeah. So I go over there and I'm kind of looking at it and this alternator had fried and wasn't working yeah well jenny operators don't generally carry a spare alternator so <laughs> right. in all intents and purposes that was going to be the end of filming yeah but day, days before that our transportation captain had bought a brand new four by four truck huge sure. thing and i was looking at it one day he had this hood open and i noticed they had two alternators yeah 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 so this happens, and I'm thinking, well, what can we do? You know, what what are we going to do? We, there, I don't have to spare. So I get him on the radio, and I get him to pull his truck up. Meanwhile, I pull the wires off of the alternator. Yeah. <laughs> and he gets to me, and I say, pull your jumper cables out. I'm going to jump from your alternator to these bare wires and see if that will get us there. <laughs> nice. So he opened his hood. He, he put the, the jumper cables on the two things on his on one of the alternators there and i ran those jumper cables up to the door and attached them to the ends of the leads for the wires for the alternator started up the generator and it ran the rest of the night like that, that with his truck running that's to the that, generator. that's an awesome so we got the shot that that's an awesome story yeah. that's all that's that's great somebody um yeah. somebody asked a question about um and i'm sorry it's gone up in the scroll um of the feed but someone asked a question about um, keeping up crew morale, the importance of crew morale, all your dudes working with you on your crew and you're doing nights. Let's say you're, you're junk, you're I got a month of nights and everyone's tired. And, and as, as the boss, you know, like you're running your department, how do you keep any, 
words of advice for guys and men and women in that position that that you just yeah i would say you know carry a big stick and no just kidding <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm probably grumpy i'm probably grumpier with myself nowadays 